Now, brothers and sisters, I want to talk tonight in kind of a family home evening setting. I hope to say something interesting, useful, and maybe even a little inspiring. But I want to begin with uh, just a, a few bits about my background, some of which has already been mentioned tonight. I grew up here in Los Angeles. Uh, it is an exciting place, and I remember being excited as a young boy growing up in Whittier, uh, going to high school, uh, at John Muir High School in Pasadena. Boy, wasn't that wonderful when we won CIF. Boy, it was really exciting. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and a lot of our graduates went to SC, by the way, and some to UCLA, and some to Washington, anyway. And my high school quarterback uh, buddy went to Stanford. So California football. I have to say this because we're talking here tonight, we're sponsored by the John A. Widso Foundation, which is connected with USC. So if you're from UCLA, I apologize that. But, uh, <laughs> but in just one day, I've learned that if you're anywhere near downtown, you have to be a Trojan these days. So. Well, it was exciting to me. And what I want to ask you is, are you excited? to be here in Los Angeles? Are you excited to be doing the things that you're doing? Are you as excited as Angel Gentle was about that wonderful story that he told? Boy, I love the Gospel of Matthew. A gospel written by an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew was an apostle. And by the way, I don't take uh, much don't give much credence to the idea that the Gospel of Matthew was written long after and not by people who actually heard and walked with Jesus. And he may have written it a little bit late in his life, but I believe that Matthew was... Oh, and Brother Rollins, you didn't say that I was a tax lawyer at O'Melvin and Myers, so I love tax collectors. Well, not the IRS type, but... And people ask me, how could Matthew have been an apostle if he was a tax collector? Well, I think that Matthew was a Levite. His name is Levi in the Gospel of Luke. And what does that mean? What did the Levites do? They collected the temple tax. They collected the tithing. And I think that meant that they had a writing book. They gave receipts. They knew how to keep notes of transactions. Matthew was a scribe. Had to be. And what that means is he was using technology. Yes, writing is a type of technology. But I think that means that this Matthew kept notes. <laughs> and he probably would have used those notes and shared those notes. Now that can explain a lot of things that we have in the New Testament that puzzle people. But lawyers always come up with good answers. We hope the jury will buy them. So. Well, uh, so Los Angeles, exciting place to be. And uh, let me just say, if Los Angeles doesn't turn you on, baby, you ain't got no switches. <laughs> we used to say that in the 1960s, right? Anybody remember that? No, okay. Now, I want to thank Jacob here for running the uh, PowerPoint, which just went blank. <laughs> so, uh, it'll, it'll boot up, okay. Uh, but here we go to uh, some... Wow, that is exciting. <laughs> I knew it. Anyway, I went, uh, you know, click. There we go. I was excited to go to Dodger Stadium and watch... Sandy Koufax, pitch, no hitters. I was there one night when he struck out 25 batters and faced only 28. When you walk out of uh, Dodger Stadium after watching Sandy Koufax, somebody would hand you a ball. Even if you're right-handed, you'd pick it up and try to throw it with your left hand. It just looks so natural. Now, I was excited about that, but I learned a lot of things along the way. Sandy Koufax, how many of you know of Sandy Koufax? I hope you all do. Yes, okay. Go Dodgers. But uh, 
you all know that he was Jewish. You all know that he never pitched on the Sabbath day. Now this not only meant that Sandy Koufax could go to synagogue and observe his religion, but that Don Drysdale and Johnny Padres and everybody else who was on the pitching rotation with Sandy Koufax would adapt so that he could observe his religion. Now, I learned a lot of things along the way in my life, and one of them was to respect the religion of other people. And I learned that not just from Sandy Koufax. I learned there to keep the Sabbath day holy. But I also learned to respect the rights of other people. And Los Angeles is a diverse place, and you can uh, learn a lot of things. I also learned a lot growing up in La Cañada, which is right next to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, uh, where I learned about excitement in the sense of exploration. Uh, I was there when we were shooting off the first rockets, which some of which have finally made their way all the way to Pluto. And uh, technology was just in its infancy. I remember going to JPL and to Caltech as a junior high school student, and they showed me this great thing. It was a whole room, almost this size, of great big uh, contraptions. That's all it could be called. With great big uh, reels of magnetic tape. And these they called it a computer. And they said, it's amazing. Look what it can do. And it could take, in three hours, it could do something that I could do mathematically in my head. I thought, well, what's the big deal? But that's where computers and technology were in those days. But it was because of those little computers that so much has come about. And I learned that in Los Angeles. And finally, here we are at uh, the Los Angeles Temple. Uh, I was baptized in 1955. That meant I was eight years old and baptized and old enough to be able to come to the dedication of the Los Angeles Temple. President David O. McKay dedicated this temple, and this was a temple that he loved. And as you can see, no, we'll get to it later, uh, he was here personally and was in, you know, friends with Cecil B. DeMille and a lot of people here in Los Angeles. As we came out of the temple dedication, he stood and shook the hands of every single person who was here. Now, the president of the church can't do that anymore. We're bigger today. But uh, we can have personal contact through technology uh, that is probably even more meaningful than what I was able to have. But as an eight-year-old boy, I learned that David O. McKay was a prophet of God. And I learned that the dedication of this building meant something really special. And I'm glad to be back here. This is the temple I was, in, it was endowed in. Uh, this is uh, a temple that is kind of our family temple in a lot of ways, although Jeannie and I were both married in the Idaho Falls Temple. And uh, uh, what a blessing that is. So... Today, of course, as was mentioned, I, uh, I'm at BYU, and uh, I've been very fortunate to be able to be involved in a lot of very interesting projects, and uh, many of them came about by miraculous sorts of ways, things that I could never have orchestrated or made to happen. Um, I mean, take the Encyclopedia of Mormonism that we published at, at BYU 24 years ago. That encyclopedia will celebrate its 25th anniversary, and we're hoping that we can involve lots of people, maybe some of you in this room, in doing a 25th anniversary celebration and updating of that document. But you wonder, how did that encyclopedia of Macmillan publish that? How did that get, get started? Well, you may remember back in the 1980s, there were bombings, and Mark Hoffman forgeries, and uh, news reports that uh, weren't very flattering about the church. But there was one man who was the president of the Macmillan Publishing Company who was very excited to learn something that he didn't know about his own New York state. He never knew that Mormonism began in New York. So he went down to the New York Public Library personally, 
walked up to his friend, who was uh, one of the reference librarians, and said, I'd like to see the Encyclopedia of Mormonism. And she said, there isn't one. He said, oh yes, there must be one. How can there not be one? He said, no, believe me, I know. There's not one. He walked out saying, there will be one. And that was just the beginning. Now the Lord has his peculiar ways of doing things in our lives. And sometimes we think things that are just total losses will have a way of turning around and doing the will of the Lord in ways that we couldn't have expected. Now that's certainly one of them. I ended up serving on the editorial board of the encyclopedia and after that uh, being appointed, my reward for being a good editor was uh, to, uh, uh, well here I am in the law school, but my uh, reward was that I was made the editor-in-chief of BYU Studies, which I've been doing now for 25 years. Yeah, four times a year. So, lesson number one is there's a website. BYU Studies is big time into media. And I, it, by the way, the website's down right now, so don't go and <laughs> look for it right now. But when it's back up, uh, we pioneered some of the earliest use of computers for Mormon journals, and you can search these things and I mean, BYU Studies has been published now for uh, 57 years, thousands of pages. When my children ask me questions, Dad, what's the answer to this? I say, either, well, BYU Studies has an article on that, or the Encyclopedia of Mormonism has an article on that. You can now find all of these things on the web, and what a blessing that is. So... You've already figured out that I'm involved in a lot of different media and trying to, you know, trying to figure out how we can best use whatever skills and talents and opportunities the Lord gives us. So, you know, there, there are a lot of puzzles in life. Um, some of these puzzles are because we divide our lives into an either-or kind of analysis, where I'm either going to be led by reason or by revelation. I'm either going to be saved by grace or by works. I'm either going to uh, you know, focus on my rights as an individual or I'm going to try to build a community. And so often we think that it has to be one or the other. One of the great miracles of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that it tells us that both <laughs> work. That it's both. It's not an either-or kind of situation. But how do you get the two together when they appear to be opposites? Well, one way is you go to the temple and you learn that opposites are a part of this world, that it was created, that there would be an opposition in all things. Wow, that is a very fundamental axiom of Mormon thought that you won't find in any other theology. Now, how do we understand this opposition that pervades everything that we do? We understand that by turning to a larger picture. Those oppositions are a part of a plan, and the plan helps us to unify our thought. Now, when God is involved in a plan, we call it theology. One of the controversies or problems that we face in the modern world is, are we going to be people who want experiences that are immediate, in other words, that are just direct experiences, or are we going to have mediated experiences? And media is what we're talking about when we use technology. And some people think that it, if you go with media, you can't have immediacy, directness. But you can. You can have both. And the way you get both is by having Jacob turn the computer back on. What do you think? 
It's by stand, standing uh, at a higher position. And let me suggest, you've never heard this before, but suggest that we might want to think about a theology of media. If God's hand is in media, and believe me, it is, then we need to give an explanation of this based on theology. Why does God use it? How does God use it? And is God's use of it consistent with other things that he does? Sometimes he speaks directly to people. But sometimes he speaks through media. Sometimes he speaks through angels. Thank you, angel, for your mediation of that story tonight. Uh, and by the way, the word angel means in Greek, angelos, messenger. So any messenger is a mediator going from one person to another. Does God use messengers? Yes. Does God use media? Yes. Does that mean he never speaks directly or in? No. We have both. And why? Because we understand the theology that it's a part of God's need to communicate clearly to as many people as he can, to embrace all of us in all of the ways possible. Now, for Latter-day Saints, we don't believe in kind of a simple version. Yes, the gospel is plain. But we also believe that the gospel is full. It's abundant. And so you have both. We don't want to have just half a loaf, but the whole. So let me suggest that there is a theology of media that we might want to think about a little bit. And we're just going to play with a few words here. Uh, think of the words like a medium. A spirit is a medium. Uh, what about mediation? Jesus Christ is a great mediator. He mediates between us and God. That's what atonement is all about. Uh, he is a mediator, providing a channel of communication. Prayer is a type of media. And prayer through the Spirit, Joseph Smith taught, is going through some type of medium. Because all spirit, Joseph Smith said, is actually a type of matter only finer than we can perceive. So there's mediation there, too. Other parts of our understanding of the plan of salvation involve the need for mediation. What about the fall? Fall is separation. That means there's something put between us and God, requiring that we be brought back together again. That separation calls for a mediator or elements that can bring us together. The ultimate mediator, as I've said, of course, is Christ. Words are themselves a type of media. Individual words, or performances, music, and other things. And thus it's not accidental that in the beginning was the word. The creation of a manner of mediation that could then bridge the chasm between divine God and fallen man. I know that Jesus Christ is our great mediator. And that when we use media of any kind, and one of the greatest things we can do in this world to find meaning and happiness is to try to find some way in which the thing that we are focusing on is a type of Christ, somehow symbolizes something that Christ did or stood for. And if you can see in media ways in which Christ would have used or himself is typified by these actions or bridgings, being in between, in, be, in the, the twain, between the two, uh, I believe that we see what it means when Christ says that through his atonement he is in and through all things. But if we don't look for him, we're not going to see him there. Well, brothers and sisters, I'm going to leave the theology part for just a minute, but before I do, let me bear you my testimony that I love and know Jesus Christ to be my Savior, your Savior, 
the Savior of the world. He's our friend, our mentor, teacher, my Lord, my brother, my Redeemer, and all that anyone could ever ask of him. People sometimes talk about belonging to the church. That's true, we do. But do you ever stop and think about how we belong to Christ and what that means? By his redemption, he has purchased us. We belong to him. That's what belonging is really all about. It's not just some thing that we feel good about. Or, you know, I belong because, like, I belong to the country club or I belong to some social bridge club or, you know, whatever. Don't play bridge, so. Maybe you do here in Los Angeles. We used to. But uh, you follow what I'm saying. Uh, Jesus is more than just a historical figure. He is the person I belong to. And he owns me. He owns my time. He owns me. And I know that because he owns me, he can make more of me than I ever possibly could. And I testify of that in his name. Well, does God make use of theology, I mean of, of media? Well, let's look at a few things here as we go through a quick history of media. Uh, how about writing itself? There's an interesting article that was written long ago by Hugh Nibley called The Genesis of the Written Word. You can still find it on, the, on LDS.org. It happens to have been published, of all places, in the New Era. So it was aimed at young people. And by the way, my first article in the uh, church magazines uh, on chiasmus was also published in the New Era. Now, the church back in the 1970s was complimenting the youth of the church by saying, we think you ought to stretch a little and read about Hugh Nibley. <laughs> but uh, what's Nibley's theory about uh, the origin of writing? Uh, he points out that the ancient people thought that writing itself was a miracle. You stop and think about it. You put these little squiggles on a page, and somebody can actually repeat what those words mean and sound them out and other people can then listen to what was said miles away while someone wrote that down and sent it with a messenger for it to be read by someone else. How does that happen? Well, of course, it happens because people learn how to read. But to the ancient mind, that was beyond really much comprehension. And by the way, if somebody asks you, how does your cell phone work? I don't know, I just push the button and it comes on and it works. Well, I mean, there is a physics behind it, but I can't explain how much, and I'll bet very few of you can explain how a cell phone works. Writing, language, translation, translating the Book of Mormon, how did it work? Well, these are miracles. God uses language so that he can communicate with us and and the ancient people said this was something that happened all along, and there were religious purposes for writing from the very beginning. The earliest written texts, which we have, this one, for example, a cuneiform clay tablet, is a record of temple offerings. People had brought temple sacrifices, and those were recorded, written, so to speak, in the temple book of life. Well, they went from there to papyrus, why are they writing these things down? <coughs> this Book of the Dead was buried with coffins, uh, buried in coffins, so that the mummies, when they were resurrected, when they came forth, would know the texts that they needed to know in order to pass by the sentinels, knowing the words and what they had to say in order to pass into uh, the uh, life in the West, over where the sun sets of glory. Well, these uh, obviously had great religious importance to them. Writing, serving a, a great religious purpose. Parchment was used after papyrus, and the uh, parchment scrolls, like from the Dead Sea Scrolls, 
include the great Isaiah scroll. What an interesting thing that prophets, yes, they spoke, but how would we know what Isaiah said if it hadn't have been written down? And the Isaiah scrolls, even though they aren't written in the same year that Isaiah made those prophecies, the great Isaiah scroll, notice that the uh, it's dated from 300 to 100 B.C. This is really old. And when you think how old, this scroll was discovered in 1947. Before this was discovered, the oldest Isaiah scroll that we had was 9th century A.D. Now people wondered, uh, was the I well, is the Isaiah text in the Bible credible? Is it reliable? Lots of people were doubting. Like Peter, Jesus said, Why doubtest thou? Well, along comes the Dead Sea Scrolls, and guess what? The great Isaiah scroll is almost identical. Little tiny changes, but not much. Now, there's one interesting little change, and yes, that change happens to be also in First Nephi, but we won't go there for a minute. But the Isaiah scroll was preserved miraculously in a way to come forth as a testimony of the fact that these books had been written down and treasured for so long. A codex. A scroll could only be you know, rolled up in one big scroll, but a codex is a book where you can now begin to put uh, different things on pages and bind them like we do in a book. Well, there was a need to be able to do that. When you have four different Gospels, you want to have them all in one book. And uh, some of the early Gospels, uh, uh, there's, there, there are uh, Gospels from the, uh, uh, well, codexes from the 4th and 5th century that have, like all four of the Gospels in them, and others. So what I'm saying here is that these, uh, these things were written uh, in ways that would serve the purposes of the Lord so that his writings could be, uh, could be preserved, could be understood, and, and so on. Of course, uh, movable type is another thing we could talk about, but let's kind of jump on through movable type. You know how that finally happens with Gutenberg in the 1430s. Uh, now, all of these kinds of changes that we've been sort of dancing around here for a minute are in a way, I want to just, just focus on how the world has changed. We talk about the technological revolution, but there have been lots of revolutions in the history of the world and in the history of technology. But, you know, the Lord finds a way to use these revolutions. Revolutions are disruptive. They change social relationships, they change family structures, they change economics, the old ways have to be readjusted. There are principles that will survive these revolutions. And sometimes these revolutions will destroy what people think uh, should be maintained. And maybe they should. But also these, these revolutions can be then turned to do good. I like to talk about a hammer, you know, a tool. Is a hammer good or bad? It depends on what you use it for, absolutely. A hammer can either be used to tear down or to build up. Is technology good or bad? It's exactly the same. Are these revolutions good or bad? It depends on how we use them. But they can certainly be used for bad if we're not really careful and use them and learn to use them correctly. What's this? This is the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians, one of the greatest catastrophes at a time called the Axial Period when all of the great civilizations, Egypt is collapsing, the Assyrian Empire is collapsing, and Jerusalem is destroyed. And the Jews and the House of Israel get scattered over the whole world. Does God use that? Does he turn that, kind of like the Encyclopedia of Mormonism, into an op opportunity? Lehi leaves at this time. So that God's will and his work can be testified of and that the blessings of Abraham can be spread throughout every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Now that was a bad revolution in some senses. 
but not entirely. Look at the next one. How about Alexander the Great? This is a great revolution. All of a sudden, everybody has to learn how to speak Greek. Uh, wouldn't that be good? Actually, you speak more Greek than you think if you go to medical school. But uh, what happens here? Alexander the Great, 330 BC, conquers the world. And now you have a lingua franca, you have a common language. And soon the Bible will be translated, the Old Testament, into Greek. It's called the Septuagint. And after about 300 years, when Jesus is born, that Bible has become the standard Bible. How can Paul go preaching to the Romans? And how can the apostles take the command, the great apostolic command, to take the gospel to all the world? Unless they can speak the language that everybody speaks. And almost everyone in most parts of the Roman Empire spoke some Greek. And in the eastern part, they all spoke Greek very well. So it wasn't just a little Jewish uh, uh, uprising in Galilee that you know people speaking Aramaic, and who's going to understand this anyway? The New Testament, all of it, written in Greek. This is the use of media. And it's the Lord saying, hmm, maybe I can use those pagan Greeks for something. <laughs> well, what else? The Roman Empire. Augustus Caesar. How does uh, this revolution affect God's work? Well, how does Paul get around? How does Peter get to Rome? Well, they sail. How can they do that? The Romans have conquered the whole Mediterranean, and they have rid the entire sea of pirates. They called it, in fact, Nostra Mare, our sea. And what did this mean? It was a free trade zone, free traffic. Anybody can sail all over they want. Christians make use of this. How about the roads? Yeah, those roads were built for Roman power. But now Paul could walk on those roads. People could get places that they otherwise never would have been able to before. God will use that revolution in ways to, to enhance communication. That's another kind of media. Now, can you see where this is going? Technology, computers today, not much different. Enhancing computers and communications, and software, and all of this, well, God can make use of these things too. The fall of Rome, big, big revolution. What happened here? Slavery. Roman, the Roman Empire was built on the backs of slaves. And with the fall of Rome, we have individuals now being able to make choices. The Roman power is crushed you know, by people who don't have slaves. And another revolution, you of course have in the Middle Ages the rise of the university, another great revolution, an intellectual revolution. But for the first time, people other than theologians can begin studying mathematics and science and astronomy, languages, music, and other things. That's a revolution, and in communication as well. And then the big one, printing. Uh, where would we be without the printing press? Without people being able to translate? Tyndale comes along, is able to translate the Bible into English. It gets printed. Before then, every Bible was hand copied. Uh, so, uh, the Industrial Revolution, the next big revolution, starts in the uh, about the time Joseph Smith Sr. is born. And uh, and you have machines which allow for boats and communication, sailing across the Atlantic Ocean, and lots of other, and printing presses. Of course, the American Revolution, giving us uh, not only the Bill of Rights and the right to worship, but also what I call the Bill of Duties, which is the preamble to the Constitution. Those rights come with some responsibilities and objectives and purposes that we are all bound collectively to uh, accomplish. And then, of course, there's the French Revolution, which, uh, uh, in a, a more extreme form of revolution, still was necessary to break down the, uh, the, the state churches and the empires that were uh, 
supported by the uh, alliance between church and state in uh, most of the world at that time. Well, these are revolutions. Technology is, uh, like I said, to be understood in these uh, in much in these same ways. Of course, these revolutions helped us with uh, uh, the restoration, and uh, we've kind of hit this one already. Paul uses uh, media. Uh, he uh, he writes letters to everybody. Uh, the Gutenberg Bible uh, gives uh, gives us that. The Reformation. It's not just the uh, the Gutenberg Bible, however. It's also things like Martin Luther. How did his 95 theses get circulated so widely that it creates a 30-year war and a huge upright uh, reformation against the uh, Catholic? Well, maybe I'm going on and on and on with this, but I want you to see that uh, uh, without media, uh, the world would be a lot, lot different. Things, however, took a special turn uh, in, uh, interestingly, the year 1820. Uh, we all know this as an important date because of the first vision. Uh, Merrill Bateman, Elder Bateman, who was president of BYU and was a specialist in uh, economic and what they call econometrics, uh, measuring and figuring out, projecting uh, where the economy is going. Uh, President Bateman uh, ran across an interesting book by William Bernstein called The Birth of Plenty. And what he found there was a statement that the bald fact is that the Renaissance and the early Enlightenment only minimally elevated the lot of the average person. Now, there were those revolutions before, but something real different happened uh, in 1820. Until approximately 1820, per capita world economic growth, the single best way of measuring human material progress registered zero. In 1820, there's a change. Beginning around 1820, the pace of economic advanced, advance picked up no, noticeably, making the world a better place to live. What happened? An explosion in technological innovation, the likes of which had never before been seen. This, of course, will change everything from property rights to scientific method to efficient capital markets, fast and efficient communication, transportation, and make the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ and taking it to all the world possible. And a wealthy enough or flourishing enough group of people at all levels of society who can make independent choices and can pack up and move and can break out of the uh, uh, previous incapacities that they had. Well, Joseph Smith was born into this time, and I think not unlikely, not accidentally. Uh, the Book of Mormon itself prophesies that it will come forth, but not until there's a time when it can possibly succeed. Lots of prophecies in the Book of Mormon, and some general ones in the Bible, of course, as well, about this miraculous Book of Mormon which, by the way, Isaiah called a marvelous work and a wonder. And in Hebrew, marvel and wonder are the same word. So it's a miraculous work and a miracle, which is a Hebrew way of saying a big miracle. Miracle squared. Well, so what media did the church uh, actually use right off the bat? And how did it contribute to the rise of Mormonism and... Uh, its growth as a new religious movement. Well, first of all, uh, we have the printing of the Book of Mormon uh, at the, with the Grandin Press. If any of you have been to the Grandin Building in Palmyra, uh, you uh, have heard the story about this man Grandin who just happened to be starting up a new business and needing customers and was so eager that he made the most foolish contract in the world 
printed all those books, actually Grandin will go out of business in 1831. But he was there when he was needed, and there was a big boatload of paper that just happened to be there that allowed all those 5,000 copies of the Book of Mormon to be printed. The largest print run of any book published in the United States to that point. How did that happen? Well, the stars were aligned? No. The hand of the Lord was there, ready to use the media that was available. Church printing, of course, continued in lots of ways. Um, uh, the, one of the first investments that the church made was to buy a printing press and some land where they could establish a printing office in Kirtland. W.W. W. Phelps will, uh, uh, will print a number of books. Oliver Cowdery will print there The Messenger and Advocate starting in 1833. 1833, the church is publishing a newspaper. Wow. And in 1833, the Book of Commandments is printed. 1835, a hymnal. And by 1837, they were out of copies of the Book of Mormon and had to print a second edition on this little press that they... This is not a machine-driven press. This is every page, up and down, put them in, and every piece of type, hand set. Amazing. Well, the Deseret News, it's uh, not much different when the saints get to Salt Lake City. They begin printing in June of 1850 not even three years after they'd arrived, a newspaper. And uh, the church can boast having the first successful daily religious newspaper in the world. Do you think the church is invested in media? You bet. They have been from the very beginning. And what can we learn from the church's use of media? Well, I think that it is to fulfill the apostolic call that Jesus gave to the apostles that the gospel should be preached to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people and take it to the ends of the world. How can that be done except through using every means possible? The telegraph. Uh, Brigham Young said, the construction of the electric telegraph and methods of using it Enabling people to send messages from one end of the earth to the other is just as much a revelation from God as any ever given. My grandmother, as a teenage girl, was the telegraph operator for the first telegraph in Idaho, in Franklin, Idaho. So, it's not that long ago. Yeah, it was a long time ago. Well... Uh, we have uh, recordings made of uh, uh, some of our early leaders of the church. Have, have any of you ever heard Wilford Woodruff's testimony? In 1897, on a little wax disc, he wanted to use media to record so you could hear his testimony. Jed, can, uh, Jacob, can you play that one? temple ordinances today, if it hadn't have been for him as the president of the St. George Temple when it first opened. He had a chance in 1897 to bear his testimony and leave it as a permanent record. And what does he choose to testify about? The sealing powers, the keys that were given by Joseph Smith to the Twelve to carry on after his life. Uh, well, I did want to just real quickly wind up on a few things because much of this is now coming into uh, your own experience with uh, television, radio, satellite broadcasts, so many other things that President Hinckley emphasizing that 
Communication is the sinew that binds the church as one great family. How can you be a family if you don't communicate together? And we as Latter-day Saints believe that all members of the human race are family members. And President Hinckley, you know how long he worked with media? 73 years he worked for the church in media. He saw a lot of changes. And what a lot of miracles that would have been. Well, we haven't even touched on the internet yet, but I assume that you know all about LDS.org and use it frequently, one of the most visited sites anywhere on, uh, uh, on the planet. Family Search. People of all faiths use Family Search to be able to locate their ancestors and genealogy. In 2012, more than a billion digital images and indexes of records from all over the world were available on Family Search. And uh, President Hunter said, in recent years, we have begun using information technology to hasten the sacred work of providing ordinances for the deceased. How could we do what we're doing in the temple without technology and the computers to uh, keep us going? Well, President Eyring says that if our technology does not improve the lives of others, and help bring them home to him, to Christ. We have missed the mark. So the question is, are we using it to learn, to share? Are, are you all aware of the LDS Media Library and make good use of that? Are you all aware of the LDS Scripture Citation Index? Maybe not. But if you go to scriptures.byu.edu, you can find any place in any general, general uh, authority talk from the very beginning that refers to any passage of scripture in any four of the standard works. This is an amazing tool. Uh, we've got now Book of Mormon Central, which is a new effort uh, consortium that uh, the John A. Widso Foundation is uh, supporting and helping to be a part of, and a lot of others are affiliated with as we're putting together but hopefully will become a, co a complete collection of everything that's ever been published about the Book of Mormon, and making it all interactive. There will be a wiki, or we're putting notes up on the wiki. We need lots of people to volunteer to help with these kinds of websites, and I'm sure there will be many, many more that are coming along. So many interesting things that uh, you know, people are finding out about the Book of Mormon that uh, little notes and details. We have on the uh, Book of Mormon Central website not only the uh, texts and uh, this great big archive, but these things we call no whys. And let me just say, as far as technology is concerned, it's not just enough now to have information at our fingertips. We have lots of information. In fact, we have so much information it can be quite confusing. It can be like uh, those waves starting to wash up against Peter's ankles, where we see confusion and we see unsettled uh, problems. Uh, with the chaos all around us. T.S. Eliot said at one point, uh, the vast accumulations of knowledge, or at least of information, deposited in the 19th century, he was in the early 20th century, have been responsible for an equally vast ignorance. When there is so much to be known, when there are so many fields of knowledge in which the same words are used with different meanings, when everyone knows a little about a great many things, it becomes increasingly difficult for anyone to know whether he knows what he is talking about or not. And when we do not know, T.S. Eliot would have said it that way. <laughs> when we do not know, or when we do not know enough, we always tend to substitute emotions for thoughts. Interesting insight. And what's that telling us? We have lots of information at our disposal. And what we need to know is not just what, but why. 
Why is it important? Why is it useful? Why is it said this way? The no whys are trying to help people to get to that point. Okay, let me uh, go off track here for just uh, one last uh, concluding thought here. On the web, we have an opportunity to let our light shine and be who we are and let the world see who we are. I was just down at the J. Reuben Clark Law Society conference and learned a little story about how something amazing, miraculous happened in Pennsylvania, where we now have the new visitor center at Harmony, Pennsylvania, where the Book of Mormon was translated and the priesthood was restored. Uh, for years, the church had tried to get the Department of Transportation in Pennsylvania to reroute a little road so that the visitor center could be uh, built there uh, in Harmony, and they wouldn't cooperate. Another appointment for one more try was set up about four years ago. And then that great hurricane hit the East Coast, totally inundating New Jersey, Philadelphia, New York. You remember all of that. Well, you remember the church's response. They put together an operation called Helping Hands. And people from all over uh, you know, that, that seaboard went in to help clean up the mess and fix things. About two weeks later, the scheduled meeting was held uh, with the Department of Transportation in Pennsylvania, and the church leaders showed up to make one more request for that road to be changed. And as the conversation naturally would have turned, it, people started talking about the weather and how bad it had been and what was going on. And they started saying, but you know, there's these group of people that have been out helping, helping hands. And somebody said, no, isn't that the Mormons? And then they have this request here from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and they start putting the pieces together, and they say, wait a minute, were you the people who were out doing that? And the director of the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation said, now, wait a minute, my brother lived on Long Island, and the Helping Hands people were just there, and they cleaned up his house. What do you want? <laughs> you can have it. What's the moral of this little story? We do what we can. We do our best. We do what the Lord wants. We serve. We let our light shine. Media will let it be a part of that. We will be known for good. People may make it into evil. Joseph Smith said he would be known for good and for evil throughout the whole world. But we are to make it known for good. It's said, and I don't know whether it's true or not, that one time Brigham Young uh, came in a wagon up to a little river and they got stuck. And the person sitting next to him on the wagon said, Brother Brigham, maybe we need to pray. And Brother Brigham said, I prayed this morning. Get out and push. <laughs> Judge Clifford Wallace told that story. And what does that tell you? Well, we've got media. We need to get out and push. So let's, uh, let's get our work done and uh, make use of the tools and opportunities that we've been given. Well, in conclusion, brothers and sisters, the gospel can help us find meaning even in unlikely places while using mundane technology. When you look on your toolbar and it says, save, well, think of salvation. When it says, search, search, ponder, and when it says, help, get some help by praying. You think how much memory your computer has? Well, your brain has a lot more memory. Load it up, memorize. These little hints can direct us to make these things into great miracles. Things in our lives become theologically meaningful, as I said, and even sacred, when we can see how these teach us gospel principles 
and help us to do the will of the Lord. I testify that his hand is in this work, that the great mediator will help us to find him immediately. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen.